Well, turning now to our big story, an in-depth look at what is going on at Michigan State University. Nolan ended up getting a sit-down interview with MSU President John Engler a few days ago. Nolan, give me a sense of um, how much time you spent with him and how you found him um, and, and kind of what your, the, the tone of your conversation was like. It was about an hour and a half total with uh, with the governor, and you know he was very focused on on mission. You know he wanted to talk about about the procedures and policies that he's put in place and is putting in place. You know I asked him what he found when he walked in the door, and to me the most significant part of the interview was that that answer when he said, you know there was no structure here, nobody was in charge here. Um, it was very diffuse, very disorganized. Nobody was responsible for anything. And he said, you can see how this situation was allowed then to fester because nobody was watching anyone. He expressed great frustration with the university processes like tenure. You know, he was like, well, why can't we fire that guy? You've got a guy tra charged with all of these counts of, of criminal sexual contact. Why can't we fire him? And he, you know, I, I think he's a bit frustrated by the limitations uh, a university structure puts on reform. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the mm -hmm. interview and then we'll come on out and uh, we'll discuss what he had to say. Go ahead, take a look. John Engler, you're here at MSU, Michigan State University, as interim president, brought in to fix a real mess here and deal with a real crisis. How do you define your mission? Well, I think I've got two jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I came here first and they said yes. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife, Michelle, and I talked this over. I love the university. And if I could help, and I happened to be available, I'd retired from the round table. Mm -hmm. And I came here, and after talking to the trustees, there's two, two main jobs. One is obviously to respect uh, the pain and the suffering that the survivors have incurred. I mean, the, mm -hmm. this has been tough. It happened over a lot of years, a lot of damage done. So, you know, try to help them. They're all suing the Michigan State, so we've got to work through those lawsuits. But at the same time, the other thing that they're saying, and they've said this in the courtroom, day after day, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? How do we fix the process? And, and so I've spent a lot of time doing that. I actually, we've got you know this document about a safer campus. Mm -hmm. So make the campus safer, make sure this can't happen again. And then at the same time, get this ready for a process to select a new president who can be here for the next decade. So you don't expect to be here forever. How long would you expect to be here, John? I'll, I'll go tomorrow if we get a new president. But you know, realistically, it's not, where do you Realistically, think? it's probably past the first of the year. I okay. think if the search process can get started later in 2018, maybe it can mm -hmm. be wrapped up in either the end of the year, more likely, I suppose, sometime after the first of the year. So then. what have you done? What's in, in this document in uh, terms of policies? Three main categories, Nolan. Mm -hmm. we've, we've been dealing with patient care and safety. Nasser mm -hmm. was a physician. He abused these young women and girls a, as a doctor. So the, the idea of having consent that's really understanding what is that procedure, making sure there's chaperones. While many, many of these young women had their parents in the room, the procedures clearly weren't adequate because they didn't understand the abuse that was occurring in front of their very eyes. We have to fix that. We also need better records to be kept. Nasser didn't bill for a lot of the stuff that he did, and so there wasn't a record of it. He did a lot of this away from MSU. He went out of state. He went to Olympic camps, mm -hmm. and, and we ought to know what he's doing out there, and the groups that he's volunteering for need to have an obligation to tell us if he steps over the line. The Olympic Committee, when they knew he was an abuser well before Michigan State was informed, didn't tell us. What did you find when you arrived here in terms of organization, structure, culture, and how did all of that play into enabling the Nasser scandal and abuse to continue? Well, I think there were weak systems, just as I mentioned. I mean, the idea mm -hmm. that a doctor can provide treatment and it doesn't show up in the record anywhere. Mm -hmm. That we had it in, in the case of one dean, a pretty no, a lot of notoriety for Dr. William Strample. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and when I got here and took a look at his lack of professionalism, his mm -hmm. poor leadership as a dean, I said, we've got to revoke his tenure. He should never be in the university again. Mm -hmm. And so we started that process. process takes too long, but we got it started right away. And then when the attorney general investigation found other evidence of things that were not able to be known, we didn't have access mm -hmm. to his computer, we didn't know what he had in his home files. When, when they saw that, boy, it just affirmed that we were right to move. And um, we've said anybody in any of these investigations, you show up to be a bad actor, you're out. But that's also the true, if we find somebody who's not in an investigation, but we get a complaint today, and we've had complaints, we're gonna act on those people. But you found disorganization in the systems, in the processes, when you arrived here. 
Yeah, I thought they were weak. I thought they were inadequate. There wasn't enough communication, and we're mm -hmm. fixing that. And sometimes one agency at the university wasn't telling the other agency mm -hmm. what they were doing. We're trying to open those lines of communications. We've even built um, interlocal agreements. Some of this stuff was done before I got here. We're just trying to now check it and double check it and scrub everything. We want to make sure that when we're done, Michigan State's going to emerge stronger because we will have vetted every single process. This mm -hmm. report deals with patient care and safety, prevention of sexual misconduct and sexual assault, and then response if prevention fails, if there is misconduct or sexual assault, how do we respond to it? So we've got seven pages now. This will grow over time as mm -hmm. we take more actions. And what we say to people, if there's something you think we're missing, tell us because we're committed. We think that when we're done, there'll nobody be holding the candle to us in terms of what we have in place. Then it's also dependent on the leaders to make it work. Is there a culture, did you find a culture here that downplayed sexual assault, sexual abuse? Were they insensitive to what was happening to girls on this campus? I think that Michigan State probably wasn't a lot different than other universities or mm -hmm. what we saw in the entertainment industry or yeah. uh, with Weinstein or what we saw in the news industry with Lauer. Mm -hmm. There's all these problems in society. I think we're very much part of society. In that case, unfortunately, we're reflective. What I would like to see is a Michigan State that's hypersensitive and says, look, you misbehave, you're gone. You mm -hmm. can't be with our students. But I want a parent to know when their child comes here, they're coming to a safe environment. So we, we were not doing as well as we should. We, we looked at how we compare other universities and probably better than some, worse than others. You took a lot of criticism based on a meeting you had with one of the victims uh, who came to your office and said you offered her $250,000 or asked her if she would take a $250,000 settlement. What happened in that meeting? Well, that meeting was one that I, and I've had many meetings with people who've been mm -hmm. victims of nasty crimes, but talked uh -huh. to their parents. This young woman chose to offer a version. Just our memories are different than hers. That's all I've said. I don't talk about those meetings. We got a young woman who suffered a lot. We, we understand that, and that's traumatizing, and I think she's still trying to work through all of that. And just how she remembered this meeting was very different than those of us who were there. So you've been criticized for not being empathetic enough. Are you sympathetic to what's happening what's happened to these girls at the hands of, of Larry Nass? Well, I wouldn't take this job if I weren't. You, mm -hmm. you can't do this work and not mm -hmm. be sympathetic. And, and you've got to appreciate, these, these were many these were very young girls when this abuse happened. Uh, and some of them, as they've said, didn't know it for years that they actually were being abused. And so they're dealing with this. And we want to help them get through that. And we also want to make sure that our campus environment doesn't allow this to happen again, either to somebody who's a patient or somebody who's a student here. Now, there is an expectation. There's 306 lawsuits, I believe. That's the current number. There's an expectation this is going to be very expensive for MSU. How will the university pay for these settlements, and is the, the financial viability of Michigan State at risk? Well, uh, I certainly hope not, mm -hmm. uh, but I think you're right that it's probably going to be expensive and painful. Mm -hmm. uh, I mince no words about that, uh, even when people haven't really wanted to hear that. I said, no, you, you better understand, this is, this is serious. The, the settlement process is now being overseen by a federal judge. Very confidential process, uh, gag orders in place, but we do know that we start again in May. And, and I think it's really important. We don't want uh, people who've been victimized by NASA to end up being victimized by a trial court system, yeah. which runs four or five years. Right. We want to get settlements so they can move on. And the university needs to move on as well, but move on in a different, with a different attitude and, and, a, and a different approach because yeah. we're, we're now out there in America as a university has had to deal with this. Uh -huh. This is very different, but it, and it, it's coincided with the Me Too movement in the country. Mm -hmm. So it gives us an opportunity to emerge, as I said, much stronger and really be a leader. John Engler, thank you. Appreciate thank you. your time. It's a good interview, Nolan. I Thank noticed you. he did um, skirt around the issue of how is mm -hmm. Michigan State going to mm -hmm. pay for it. Um, Stephen, I'm going to go to you first, and get, what is your reaction to what you saw with Nolan says? So, I mean, I think what he's saying there about changing the structures, uh, having come in and found very little structure for dealing with this kind of thing makes a, a total sense and is, is the kind of thing that plays to John Angler's strengths, right? The, mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things he was 
very good at. Uh, my concern continues to be that this is an academic institution, one, uh, and that it needs an academic leader, uh, and that there isn't one, and that the faculty has expressed no confidence in John Engler to be that academic leader. And then uh, uh, the other question is the cultural change that needs to take place at, at uh, Michigan State University and whether Engler, who is a politician uh, by his DNA, uh, is mm -hmm. the right person to change that culture. Yeah, and you sat down with him, this was a, a couple of days ago, and yeah, so it was right. before actually, um, so the second phase of their independent review of their Title IX program came out yesterday, mm -hmm. and one of the quotes from the report was, they were concerned that MSU still struggles to communicate effectively and consistently about its values and its goals, mm -hmm. and that this weakness may irreparably undermine the university's Title IX related progress, and, and he did touch upon that a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of the communication and the, the fact that not everyone was on the same page of where the university needs oh, to be. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, th he thought communication was one of their big weaknesses, and, and that's part of the process here. Um, to Steve's point, he doesn't want to be the academic leader. I mean, he's got a specific job. He, he said his job is to get this place ready to pick a president, right. one, to have an, an orderly process for picking a president, because he recognizes the way in which he was appointed created a, a good deal of consternation and chaos. But... He doesn't want to be the academic leader. He wants out of there by the end of the year or shortly after. Uh, but these process, the, uh, the idea of these policies they're putting in place and these expectations and standards they're laying out. He talked about dealing with kids first day, second week, right. first month throughout in terms of their orientation to campus for the first year, setting expectations. You could, this is okay. This isn't okay. And he talked about even going, particularly with the kids they recruit for the athletic pro programs, dealing with them in high school mm -hmm. to try to establish uh, yeah. better behavior. Yeah. Um, you know, something that you asked him about, which I was glad you did, two things, about his, the perception of his sympathy mm -hmm. towards the victims and then also the, the, um, the different perceptions that he had and one of the victims had about a meeting that they had about mm -hmm. a potential settlement. Um, what did you think of his response on that? Because that was something that people wanted to hear. Yeah, well, I mean, so I'm less concerned about his sympathy, I guess, uh, personally, than I am his ability to affect the cultural change that would make the entire university not just more sympathetic, uh, but but more responsible and accountable uh, for these things. And I guess that's where my concern is. I don't think as a person he's unsympathetic mm -hmm. to these people, but I think that uh, the way he approaches problems uh, and the way he solves problems uh, comes across as unsympathetic. And that meeting, that woman's recollection of that meeting, I think if you know John Engler and have watched him for a very long time, you can see very clearly the path that in his mind would have led him to that kind of uh, bartering or negotiation over something like this. Uh, and, and that's, it's not just unsympathetic, uh, it's disrespectful to, again, the cultural problem that created this. In my longer interview with him, uh, you know, he talked about uh, he acknowledged the fact that he comes across perhaps uh, as uh, not as sympathetic and and you know he Deal talked maker. about he you know not being used to the rhythm of a university mm -hmm. which moves much slower and he's coming in and saying we're going to fix that we're going to change that we're going to change that and at a university the the expectation is everybody gets in you know and everybody has a vo has a voice and it's a longer process mm -hmm. uh, than you're 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 dealing with in almost any organization and he talked about how he recognized that could come across as sort of a bull in a china shop. Yeah. But. All right. Well, you know, you can read uh, Nolan's interview mm -hmm. in Detroit News and also uh, you can see it back at myweek.org. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for that, Nolan. All right.